welcome to the Creative Visionaries podcast. My name is Tori Barker, a digital marketing specialist, business owner, mom, and you guessed it, a creative visionary. This podcast is about inspiring business owners, building connections, sharing success stories, and motivating others. Join me on this journey as we tap into your true potential and unleash your inner visionary. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us again on the Creative Visionaries podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to our guest, Jason Skisik. He is a U.S. Army veteran, a coach, an entrepreneurial evangelist who helps other passionate entrepreneurs build the foundation and frameworks they need to make an impact on the world. Jason, welcome to the show. Oh, Tori, you honor me. Thank you so much for having me on. I've already enjoyed the short part of the conversation that we've had already, so I can't wait. Yes. Tell us a little bit more about who you are, what you do, and how you uh, came to this mission that you have to impact the world. Oh, well, that's a really great question. Um, so for starters, as you mentioned, um, you know, I've uh, I've been in the United States Army. I, I spent some of my young, young life there. Um, I came out of the Army and I did two things. I went to school for finance to take over the world of, of industry, which certainly never came true, uh, and ended up working in corporate banking for a little bit. Um, and I also started a small, dusty CrossFit gym in a fourth floor of a warehouse in Chicago uh, with two Army friends of mine. Um, and ultimately found a few years in that I was working on a $50 million deal or a $20 million deal. And all I could think about was this, you know, tiny little rinky dink business and this tribe that we were growing. And so ultimately decided that entrepreneurship was going to be the path for me. Um, and at first I thought I'm a fitness guy because I love helping and guiding this tribe. And what I found very quickly was really, I'm a tribe guy. And so as soon as I started to get involved with other entrepreneurs and helping each other to solve problems in our own businesses, I just realized that building tribe around these passionate visionary type folks, uh, was, was ultimately going to be the thing that I would stand on a mountain and beat my chest about. Cause that's when I, uh, when I recently started this most recent endeavor, that was the question that I went into a float tank with. I was like, what, what do I want to sell? What do I want to stand on a mountain? What would I fight for? Um, and that's ultimately what, what our program and what our course and what the, the podcast is all about. Yeah. And so what is it about a tribe that just brings people together? How does that differentiate from just a, a group of people or a network? What's the difference uh, in a tribe? Well, yeah, absolutely. So for starters, um, it's authentic. It's it's people gathering around some ethic or something, some flame, right? And so in the military, you know, you have a small group of 18 people that are tasked with accomplishing a mission and those people didn't pick each other and they can't quit. They don't get to pick what the mission is and they can't quit. And so very quickly you realize it's not just that we all agree on everything or we all like each other or anything like that, which is great when you can have it. It's really the bonds that cr that are created when we agree to do difficult things together and when we learn how to work together and when we learn how to respect each other's strengths and understand each other's weaknesses and kind of fill in the gaps. Um, and so that's why I think things like CrossFit or jujitsu or hot yoga or cycling in groups. I think these types of things are so great because they synthesize those sweat bonds, right? I call that a, cre a collective elective suffering. And so that's one of the reasons why collective elective suffering is so powerful is because you see people gathering around a yoga school or they gather around a martial arts studio or they gather around a running club or a rock climbing club or whatever it may be. And it's because it's like-minded people that are getting together, showing shoulder to shoulder, and they're fighting through these really challenging experiences. And the beauty there is you not only get the benefit of the relationships, the health and all of that, but on your spectrum of what easy and difficult is, this all of a sudden moves it so far that way that the things that used to be big hurdles for you are now tiny little pebbles in the road. Yeah. You know, and one thing that you mentioned that I, I love about uh, the tribe idea and concept is that Yes, you have like minded people, you're on, you know, a, a same mission, but sure. you're all different people. And so you yeah. all bring different aspects to whatever the tribe goal is, right. And so not only are you learning from um, each other and growing from each other, you're just taking it so much further because you are like minded, yes, but you also have different uh, strengths and weaknesses that you guys can help each other lift each other along. So I love that aspect of, you know, bringing a group together and building a tribe. Yeah. And I, I would even argue like, um, 
for many, many years, we as people have evolved to form these tribes that typically were limited to 150 people or so. It's no surprise that most entrepreneurs that run tribal businesses like yoga studios and CrossFit gyms and things like that, guess how many members they almost always have? It's almost always 150. And so we we can thank uh, Professor Dunbar for that. He figured out that primates uh, can gather. They, they typically tend to gather in these groups based on the size of a certain part of our brain. And for humans, it's 150. And so you see this 150 number everywhere. Small towns that have 150 people have almost no crime rate. They don't need wow. laws. They don't need mayors. They don't need any of that stuff. As soon as you break through that, this is um, really well documented in the book Sapiens, which I recently uh, reread. Um but yeah, and 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 after tribes, it was churches, right? How big is the average church congregation? Well, it turns out, Tori, it's 150 people, unless unless you pour a ton of money into your expertise, which is like marketing, and my expertise, which is like systems and structures, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, I think in a more secular society like we live in today, people are less still doing it, but less gathered around a um, the, uh, theological like religion. And more gathered around these kind of shared ethics, whether that's fitness or nutrition or poetry, it doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah. And do you think that, you know, our, so our world has shifted in the last, what, two years or so. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> depending on when oh, you're really? listening to this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so everything has really shifted. And and yeah. in my perspective, just kind of listening to you, it seems like this tribe concept is really going to be amplified because there's so many people who are entrepreneurs working alone or, you know, working remotely. And so there's so much more of that togetherness that we're lacking that I think is interesting to kind of, you know, keep an eye on when it comes to tribes and building tribes and, you know, entrepreneurs kind of have their own little tribe and network that they build. But what's your perspective on that? I think you're dead on. I also would say that there has been sort of a fork in the road where it's not right outside of your door the way that it once was, right? If 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 we learned anything from from the the situation with COVID, there's probably many things we should have learned. But one thing for sure is that with something like a disease, the enemy is all of a sudden your neighbor, right? And so it actually pushed us apart in some ways. And so for those of us who've just felt the pull so much that we create digital tribes, or we create environments where we can have safe tribes or whatever it may be, this was not an option for me. I, I didn't uh, I didn't have a choice on whether or not I was going to sit on this Zoom call and have this conversation with you today because it's a need that I'm aware of. But I think right. for a lot of folks, they they push that part of themselves down and they end up in these sort of, they end up finding tribes that maybe they shouldn't. So this is where you see like, um, you know, trolls on the internet, right? Kind of fueling each other and one-upping each other. This is tribal. Uh, this is where you see all sorts of dysfunction come out of because ultimately- we can't, we can ignore our human instincts, but we can't eliminate our human instincts. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. I, and, and it, to me, that kind of segues to core values, right? So oh, yeah. in a tribe, there's gotta be sh some set of core values that you all share. So can you talk about the importance of core values? Absolutely. So for starters, if you're listening to this and you're an entrepreneur, or if you're listening to this and you've just heard of core values, odds are you think you decide what they are. And I think that's a reasonable way to look at it. Certainly when I filled out my LLC, the very first time I started a business that day, I Googled what the core values of McDonald's and Apple and <laughs> Microsoft and all these other companies were. And I picked the ones that I thought I wanted to be like, and those were my core values. And then I put them on a piece of paper next to my mission statement and I slid it into a desk drawer, never to be seen or heard from again. And unfortunately, that's the problem. We look at core values as something we want, when in fact, your core values are actually the embers that burn inside of you. They make you who you are at your best, and they make you who you are at your worst. They are you, yeah. right? And so whether you choose to define them or not does not change the fact that you will have core values and you will operate on them. 
It's yeah. whether or not you have that puzzle piece that is clearly defined that now you can hold up to the future and hold up to the past and evaluate whether opportunities are going to be worthwhile or not. That's the decision you make when you decide to reveal your core values. And so when you say tribal, uh, yeah, if I look at any tribe, the people that are the most effortlessly integrated and the happiest and the most harmonious within any tribe are the ones who most closely represent those core values that we've revealed, whether you choose to find them or not, which is why when I originally did it with my two partners and we had nonsense on there and didn't use them to guide the ship, it didn't matter. The 90 or so clients that I had when I decided to turn my business into what I call like a capital B real business, uh, those folks were core value fits. When I did the re when I did the work to reveal my actual core values seven years into my business, so about five years ago, uh, then I go, oh, wow, turns out it's them. And instead of then having 90 of them, it took me seven years to get to 200 members. It took me six months to get to 300 members because now I knew exactly who I was looking for. I knew exactly the type of bait that that fish liked to eat. I knew where they hung out. I knew where they'd be. I understood my tribe before I even really filled it up, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's like uh, in marketing, you talk about your your avatar, right? Who's your avatar? And that is very much related to core values. And and I think as entrepreneurs, you know, especially when when you're getting started, um, you don't really care if your customer aligns with your core values because you're just like trying to get the deal, you're trying to make money. And there's a certain point where you have to really step back and and say, no, you know, this is not working or it's, it doesn't feel right because it doesn't align with my core values. That avatar is not the right client or the right customer or whatever it might be because of those basis of that core values. And so it's interesting to, to think about that perspective and in the growth in the projection of business owners and entrepreneurs, how, you know, we always go back to those core values. That's how we know we're working with the right people and how we're serving the right people and helping the right people. I couldn't agree with you more. And I like this metaphor of imagine I stood on a city street in New York and handed out flyers to a thing, uh, a, a, a nightclub or a show or a comedy show. Uh, and I would have to hand out a thousand of those flyers before somebody would actually look at it. Somebody would read it and go, that's something I'd like to do. And then they showed up. So for every thousand I hand out, I get one person to show up. Tori, how many wedding invitations do you think I had to hand out in order to get the people that I loved and cared about who cared about me and loved me to show up for my wedding? It's like 1.1. It's like maybe maybe like three people said no over the course right. of the 150 I invited, whatever. Uh, and so the idea there isn't that you should only invite your friends and family. It's that if you understand who wants to be in the room, who would be a good fit for what you're doing, the effort it takes is so much less because I'm not wasting hours and hours of my life standing on a street corner pitching to the world that they should somehow change to fit me. Mm -hmm. I'm giving so much thought into what I am, what I offer, and who the people are who would value that, that I can just walk up to them, put my hand on their shoulder, and hand them this nice handwritten card. And yeah. guess what? They show up and they're dressed to the nines, right? Yeah. And you make such a bigger impact when you when you work that way. Because yeah you're aligned, you both have the same values, you have the same mission. And, you know, you know, me, I'm a, you know, I like to, to serve people, right? I want to make the world better. And I want to serve people and help people with the skills and the, the creativity that I have. And so I want my clients to have that same mindset, you know, I want them to, you know, be in that thought process of, you know, not just collecting a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's making an impact and changing you know, things for the better. So I love that. that concept. Well, and I think at it, I think at its best, they're exactly the same outcome. If you truly understand what your gift is, if you have a big audacious mission, and if you execute it ruthlessly for the people that will value it, mm -hmm. the market tends to value that very highly. I yeah. mean, there are people like Elon Musk or Steve Jobs or, you know, uh, Henry Ford that could probably talk a lot about that. Yeah. Well, let's talk about how, like, let's look internally, right? So the team that you build, right? So for a company, how important is that? Obviously, you know, hugely important because that's a part of your business, but talk about the importance of that tribe internally in your business that you, you build for uh, yourself. 
Yeah, that's a great question. So when we did do our core values and we did understand our mission, there were a few people in the past that we never could figure out why they wanted to be there. They were very good at what they did, but we just, every time we would say up, it felt like down. Every time we would say right, it felt like left and we couldn't quite figure it out. And so what I would say is like, could we use a screwdriver to hammer, hammer in a nail? Absolutely. But the nail doesn't like it. The screwdriver doesn't like it. And you know, your wife's mad because there's a hole in the wall. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what I figured out was by just putting that effort in the front, I would rather now having run, I've, I've probably owned seven or eight businesses, I'd, I'd say that were actual LLCs. And I would rather spend six months or a year finding a second brain outside of my body that I can pour time and energy into that'll just do things the right way. They'll be energized by their work. They'll do more easier for cheaper as opposed to hiring the first person that checks all the boxes. I think yeah. that term is called satisficing. It's when you take the very first option that fills what you're trying to do. And I think the, the problem with building a team is you're really integrating somebody. It's a long-term commitment. And so even if you're super cynical and quick to fire, it's like three months before of wasted time and effort, not including all the time you took to find that person. And so ultimately I recommend people hire slow and fire fast. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting. I learned, I, I learned that term early in my career. I, I had heard it and I didn't really understand it until I was a business owner myself. And I'm like, yeah. that's what they mean. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's so true because it's an investment, especially, you know, your time and your energy that you're trying to build a team. And so really making sure that you have that right person, because not only are you investing your time, you're investing their time and your customers, you know, are going to be uh, experiencing any, um, you know, pains or suffering that you might be experiencing. So you have to be really mindful and careful of that. Yeah. And even once you find all of the right people, you need to realize too, that as an entrepreneur, um, entrepreneurs often have what I call the beautiful butterfly paradox. And that is, I'm a beautiful butterfly who is a visionary and creates things that didn't used to be there. And I can do all of these magical things. And everybody that I hire should be able to do exactly what I do exactly as well as I do it. These two ideas just can't coexist. And so um, what we need to realize as mindful um, visionaries is that we need to pour time and energy into the details, the nitty gritty of precisely what that magic between our ears is and codify it scientifically so that any reasonable human being that we hire, even if they're perfect core value fit, so that they even have a chance of executing it to the level of excellence that we want. And I think in the most successful organizations, particularly any with scale, that's what happens. I love that mindful visionary. Yeah. That's awesome. So, okay. So, sorry, I, I just had to say that because I love that term. <laughs> yeah. So, so you talk about kind of taking what's in the visionary's brain. Do you, would that be like SOPs or like documenting systems or processes? How do you extract that from that mindful visionary and yeah. help them to scale their, their company and, and it, it you know, utilize a person who met, meets that core values, but is not the quote unquote unicorn that you expect them to be. Sure. Um, so for starters, there's many different ways to do this with the way that I do it typically uh, with a client is I first we talk about foundations. What are the goals? What are your mission? What is your core values? How exactly do you view? What is the mountain that you want to climb? The more clearly I understand that the easier it'll be right. Um, and then we talk about frameworks. And this is how do we take that magic and scale it out to a team so that we're not trying to be magicians and do everything for everybody, right? A lot of people that I help I call magicians. They're the people that they can knock down brick walls, they can wear all the hats, and they can't figure out why they can't scale. It's because they're trying to do that thing all by themselves. Um, and so when we do that, yeah, it's all about clearly identifying the roles within the company, clearly identifying the types of people that each role are going to require, clearly identifying what their responsibilities are, how we're going to compensate them, what the training regimen is going to be like. Um, a self-employed person changes oil every single day. An entrepreneur learns how to change oil perfectly, they codify it exactly, and then they hand it off to a thousand people and start Jiffy Lube, right? There's a difference. And it's not that one's better than the other, truthfully. If you love the simplicity, Jiro dreams of sushi, if you love the simplicity of making the sushi or changing the oil, by all means, become that person. Yeah. But don't expect to have a thousand locations. 
Right. Yeah. Understand what, where you're going. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's a great point too, Tori, because the more clearly we understand the mountain we want to climb, yeah. the easier it is for somebody like you or somebody like me to go, Hey, that step leads you towards Kilimanjaro. That mm -hmm. step leads you towards Everest. It's not better or worse, but you have to understand what your actions, where your actions are going to take you. Yeah. And so you talk about frameworks. Do you have like a key framework that you use or do you apply uniquely to the customer or client that you work with the framework that you um, help them with? That's a great question. So we use a we use we use a structure called a four R's document. And so the four R's document is role, responsibility, requirements and results. And then I've added some other stuff below that as well. But um, but basically, it is fleshing out the three dimensions or four, I guess, of uh, of any given role in the organization. And then you start with what you're able to do right now. So if if you've got 10 different roles, and you need to get it all up within the next month, well, we're not going to be as granular. But over the course of time, this is a living document. And so anytime a new process process or a new uh, requirement or anything that comes into play, you know, this is where things like Loom can be leveraged. This is where things like, uh, you know, Zapier or, you know, uh, Lucid, where you can actually chart these flows out, Monday app, these types of things, you can leverage technology to make it easier and easier to um, what we call like flipping the, it's, it's called the reverse pyramid of, of management. And that's where like at the pinnacle, it's like an astronaut where you need to like be born genetically superior, have like perfect physical fitness and be like a PhD in physics in order to be an astronaut. Right. Uh, and then like at the very bottom of that pyramid is like the McDonald's fry chef or whatever. <laughs> and what we try to do as entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs want to think, oh, I want a bunch of astronauts. But the reality is the more clearly we can train and the more clearly we can uh, express our vision to our constituents, whether they're clients or staff, the more we can push those roles down the pyramid of management and make them accessible and energizable by a lower and lower um, hurdle rate of, of person. Yeah. So if you, uh, if someone was kind of listening to this and thinking, um, do I need to go through this process? What would you tell them? I would tell them if you're asking that, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, and I, I would actually look at it the other way. I would say like, if you, if you feel as if you have to do everything, if you want it done right, give me a call. If you feel as if you're so good at what you do that you couldn't possibly scale it, give me a call. You know, if you feel like uh, you hire great people and you can't quite figure it out, give me a call. Uh, but even if you don't give me a call, it starts by looking in the mirror and asking yourself very difficult questions. And so I actually don't sell answers, Tori. What I typically sell is really well-placed questions that don't hide. I believe that if you ever want to be comfortable on a stage, you need to have looked at yourself under a spotlight. And so what I mean by that is if you ever want to have any kind of notoriety or scale or impact on the world, well, then you need to know scientifically that what you're doing is good and how you do it is X, Y, and Z. And this is how we reproduce it. This is how the people that our culture honors, this is how they achieve what they achieve. Yeah. I mean, awesome. I, Jason, you've shared so many uh, wonderful um, insights and advice and your framework seems like something that anybody could, you know, really leverage. It's breaking it down, right? You just got to get down to the, yeah. the brass tacks and, you know, core values, frameworks, solutions, and really think about um, what it is that you want and, and what direction you're going, what mountain you're going to climb. So any final thoughts or a quote or any inspiring words you can leave us with? Probably just that you can do the thing that you love that is important to you. And if it feels like you can't, you're just not asking yourself the right questions yet. You're not answering the questions that that challenge has has presented to you. Um, and so what I would say is um, if you feel like what you've been doing isn't working, the only thing I can guarantee you is that doing what you've been doing harder will also not work. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, how can somebody reach out to you if they need your help and your expertise to, to answer those questions and guide them on the right direction? That's a great question, Tori. Thank you so much for asking me. First of all, if you're still listening to this, 
please go to Tori's uh, site and go to her podcast page and like it, share it, and 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 subscribe to it because she is pouring her heart out and she's really good at this. And I've done a lot of these. She's very good at this. Uh, so please support her because she's doing a great job. And if you still have any energy, I would love, love, love to have you visit www.spearandclover.com. You can find me on my platform of choice is Instagram at Jason Skisick and at Spear and Clover. Um, although you can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And I also would would love to offer to anybody listening to this that's a entrepreneur or an entrepreneur um, to come to a free test drive of our, uh, we do a t- twice a month, we do on the first and third Fridays of the month, uh, we do the Spear and Clover Mastermind, where we bring in an expert guest speaker for 30 minutes, and then we spend one hour in small groups masterminding with peers and helping each other solve our problems. Uh, yeah. So if you go to the website, you can uh, you can make, reach out to us and we'll get you booked for one of those if you'd like. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jason. And, um, you know, everybody go out there and find your path and and look for the mountain that you're going to climb. Thank you, Tori. Thanks so much for listening to the Creative Visionaries podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe, leave us a review or share with a friend. Also make sure to visit us online at creativevisionariespodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. And stay tuned for more episodes to come. And remember, it's time to tap into your true potential and unleash your inner visionary.